Hi, everybody. It's SJ Thomason, christian-apologist.com. And today we're going to talk a little bit about universalism, universal atonement, and a little on limited atonement. Limited atonement is a philosophy that was derived from Calvin, and Calvinists tend to believe that. They believe only the elect receive salvation. And so the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to go through and define everything so we know what we're talking about. And I want to say that one of the reasons I'm doing this part two is to add clarity to a video that I did rather recently that received over 50 dislikes and about nine or 10 likes. So it's a video that people disagreed with. And I thought maybe if I added clarity, it would make people understand exactly where I'm coming from on these issues, because I'm just trying to be true to what the scripture says. I believe it's very important for us to try to be true to what the scripture says and what Jesus actually taught. And if we're going to do that and be very honest with the information that's there, really we'll come to the idea of universal atonement. And so Jesus atoned, Jesus sacrificed himself for everybody. So I do not advocate and believe universalism is true. And I'll define that in just a moment. And I also don't believe in the Calvinist philosophy of limited atonement meaning that God has predestined people and they're not in any sort of a position. They've received this, this uh, position. I tried to get Veckel to come in here, by the way, and join me because he is a Calvinist, I believe, but I couldn't. So I won't try to completely expound on the Calvinist view, but they believe that only the elect and so therefore people really don't have much of a say or a choice in the matter as far as being saved. And so we're going to get a little bit into this. So we can define our terms first because I think that's very important. So I'm trying to make sure that you can all see this. So the definition universalism says that everyone eventually is saved and universal atonement says Jesus died for all. That is a belief that I have. Jesus died for everyone on the earth. And I'm going to go through again and provide scriptural evidence for everything that I say. And then there's the idea from the Calvinist, which I'm not going to really get too much into today, but it's limited atonement saying he died only for the elect. I think that we have scriptural evidence that says he died for all. And so, yeah, I want to say, say hi to St. Tommy. Great to see you. He says, never forget the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead on the third day for the forgiveness of sin. Amen, Tommy. And Tommy, go ahead and like this video so you can be the one, the first one to do that, if you will. <laughs> I already have some people who haven't liked this and I haven't even started barely. So, okay. So th there's other clarifications that I want to have here. And some of this I got from Pastor Mike Winger, I, I listened to a really excellent video by him and came up with some clarifications, which he derived from somebody called David Allen. And so apparently David Allen has some books on universalism and universal atonement. And so I will have to go get those books and see exactly what he's written, because it sounds like it's quite fascinating. So we have to think about differentiators here in the Bible. So the idea of intent, does Jesus want all to be saved? Yes. Jesus wants all to be saved. We have numerous verses that say that. Then there's the idea of extent. Jesus sacrificed himself for all. So the extent is who paid the price and how much does it cover? Okay, who paid the price? Jesus made the sacrifice for our sins. On Calvary, Jesus perfectly reconciled God's love, mercy, and justice. Okay, so he did that for all. He loved the world, all of us. And then the application says, not all will choose to accept Jesus's gift of salvation. It's the idea of free choice. Now, one of the things that universalists tend to believe is that it, it's really just a, they believe that everyone is going to be on their knees with Jesus. They believe that all of us will be reconciled to salvation. All of us will make it to heaven. However, many of them, and I'm not saying all because I could have some universalists who don't believe in this specific doctrine within universalism, which is a very sort of large, broad monster. But the idea of universalists, a lot of them say, well, it's just a matter of time. Some might come to salvation after they perish. Okay, but we have scriptures that say that that's actually not going to be an offer after you perish. And so I will get into that in a moment. And I'll also justify why I don't think that that makes sense with respect to Jesus's great commission. And so I'll talk about that too. But it's the idea, again, not all will choose it. So, and Nathan, I, I see you in here. I'm going to allow you in here after I've made my case. So I want to make my case without being 
with, with being able to go through and specify exactly where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to, to hurt universalism. I'm certainly not trying to rile you up. I noticed that there's a lot of people who seem to be a little bit triggered over this whole thing, and I'm not trying to trigger you, but I will open up the doors at the end as soon as I get through my slides here. So I've got a few slides to support what I'm saying. And so it's the idea of Joshua 24, 15. You can choose the gods you want to worship, but as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. You have the right to choose whatever you want. That's what makes Christianity so incredibly impressive, is the idea that we have this free choice. We can do what we want. So C.S. Lewis made a really poignant point. He said, the doors to hell are locked from the inside. Think about that. It's a pretty... Pretty good statement. Okay, so here's some support, and Nathan provided a couple of these. I also did take a look at David Bentley Hart, listened to some of his stuff. I saw a few different interviews, and then I read some of his material, and he is making a case for universalism. And again, I think that that's a false doctrine, and I think that we need to disabuse him of these notions. So here's some support from the scripture that people like David Bentley Hart and Nathan use to support universalism. Romans 11.32 said, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Okay, then there's this 1 Corinthians 15.22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then this idea from Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So this idea, again, aligns with the idea of universal salvation. Uh, that's what they're saying. It's bringing salvation for all people. But we see some other verses that say, yes, this is relating to what we would say is the universal atonement and the extent. Okay, so the extent. The offer has been made to all. God has forgiven all. Does that mean that God is that all are going to want to go to heaven? All are going to want to be with God in the end? No. God can forgive you, but not necessarily, you're, you might not necessarily want to be with God in the end. All shall be made alive. We are all alive and all are alive in the afterlife as well. Okay, so we've had all been made alive. We all come to life at one point, we live our lives and we all at the afterlife will see exactly what happens at that point. So here's some scriptural support for universal atonement and the extent argument. Again, the extent argument is saying, who paid the price and it is it for all. So this is saying for if, now this is from Romans 10, 13, oh, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 17 to 19. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, Paul said that in Romans, but then he goes on in Romans 10, 13 and adds, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so the implication there is all of this is offered. Jesus has offered his atonement for everyone. And you have to call on the Lord. You have to appreciate Jesus. Okay. So also we have another comment here coming. Oh, I forgot to quote that one. And I don't have it right in front of me exactly which one this is, but I'll, I'll get back to this. So for to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is a savior of all people, especially those who believe. Now think about that. Why would he insert this especially? It again is separating people in some way. There is those who believe, those who don't believe. So universal atonement, looking for the intent now. This is God's intent. And so, yeah, Mr. Phil Fox, blessings to you. Uh, good to see all of you guys, by the way, everybody in the chat. Great to see you. Thank you for coming in. And I, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be able to get Mark Charles on my channel. Just quick little segue here. Mark Charles is somebody who uh, has a Native American roots, and he has written a really compelling book about our history. And it's something that I think people need to understand and learn about because we have been sort of given a whitewashed history. And I'm saying that sort of almost a literal way in a little bit. Okay, so I exhort therefore, now here's from 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. This is God's intent. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 
for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come onto the knowledge of the truth. So God's intent is that all will be saved. But of course, again, he's given us free will. And then there's the extent argument. So again, who's covered under this? Who's covered under God's universal atonement? Everyone. It, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't say whoever doesn't believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So there's a, a differentiator there. And then Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Again, universal atonement. And here's another one. So this is really an interesting verse because this particular one is used by Calvinists to argue for limited atonement, which I'm going to show you how they do that in just a second. So it says, for by him, and then again, this is Colossians 1, 16 to 20, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now here's something I found from John Piper that I thought was really fascinating. So you have this idea of whether on earth or in heaven. So here's what the Calvinists notice there. They notice that there's a world that's missing here, okay? We have the other world. So here's the, the Calvinist conclusion. They look at Philippians 2.10 and they say, notice this, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. Okay, going back to the last one, same thing, whether on earth or in heaven, but here we had a third place and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So again, there are three locations here. We've in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So the Calvinists point to that, to point to there are some people who are confessing Jesus as Lord, even if they don't believe that they're going to worship Jesus. Okay. Here's another application. Again, so I differentiated intent, extent, and application. How is all of this applied in the Bible? So 2 Peter 2, 1 says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And another application that's pretty important to look at is the one from Luke 16, 25 to 31. We're talking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So you might know this one, but Abraham said, child, Remember that in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here. Of course, Lazarus was in heaven and you are in anguish. He was asking for water because he said he was burning. It was very hot in the location where he was. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, the argument that the universalists will make looking at verses such as this one, and also there's a multitude of dichotomies in the parables that Jesus has told. The weed, the wheats, he has the parable of the sower, you've got the parable of the ten virgins, the ones who were going to be pre preparing things and the ones who weren't. There's, of course, the parable of the sheep and the goats, that's the most specific one. But we've got a lot of dichotomies there in the parables that say that there are some differentiations. Now the universalists will look at this and they'll say that place of torment, it doesn't say eternal place of torment there. In fact, in Matthew's mainly where we get the eternal place of torment if we speak of the four gospels. But let's see, let's see what else it says. Second Thessalonians, now David Bentley Hart, I heard him saying that Paul 
does not advocate any sort of eternal destruction, did not point that out. However, Paul wrote, is, has been attributed to 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 to 9. And it says, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And then we have here some other applications. First John 4, 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now, unfortunately, there is a spiritual battle going on. And we have a lot of references to the devil, sons of the devil, sons of Satan, people related to Satan. You can find a few of those in places like Matthew 13, 38, John 8, 44, and Acts 13, 10. Let's also not forget what it says here in Mark 8, 36. And no, Charlie Reed, you're not blocked. Welcome here. I actually unblocked a bunch of people who I realized I had them blocked for quite a long time. I only I think I have two people blocked right now, left blocked, but I will unblock them possibly if I feel that they will be kind here in the, in the deal. But uh, Mark 8, 36, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And another application. Now, here's the one that David Bentley Hart has a difficult time explaining because the Greek word used to describe eternal here definitely means eternal and everlasting. And so to try to make the argument that this isn't something that occurs is really not looking at what the scripture says. So it says, Mark, Matthew 25, 41 to 46, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And you did not minister to you and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we do see again that dichotomy. And then, of course, we've got Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. So again, it's impossible. So there are uh, certainly that's a situation. So yeah, Smoky Saint, uh, I'm going to, I just want to let you guys who've just entered here know that I am going to open this up as soon as I get through these slides. I've only got a few slides left. And so I'm going to open it up to uh, an open discussion from people. I know that I've got Nathan who definitely probably wants to get in here. <laughs> and so, so here we go. So yes, I do not endorse universalism. I'm trying to give you guys some scriptural reasons why it's not the case. I think it would not, well, I'll get into this. Okay, here we go. Now, Matthew 24, 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then in 24, 30, and then will appear in heaven, the sign of the son of man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from the end of heaven to the other. Okay, people who are his elect children of God, the sheep who hear his voice. There's lots of different references to God's children. There's also the opening of the door to everybody. The offer is there for you. If you're in the, car, uh, if you're in the chat right here and you're thinking about uh, whether or not you should believe, whether or not it would be a wise decision, I believe it's a very wise decision. Now let's get into the, the Mac Daddy of all of these comments. And this comes from Revelation. And I say the Mac Daddy because David Bentley Hart seems to think that at first he said he thought Revelation was woo. And then he said he noticed that these doors were open to people on the outside at the end. Now, I read over the whole Revelation and did not find what he's talking about. So I can't say that I know what he's talking about, because here is what it says. Revelation 20, 12 to 15. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. 
Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Here's what it also says. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murders, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, so some people, David Bentley Hart seems to think that there's going to be some sort of a cleansing fire, that everybody's going to be passed through this cleansing fire, and everybody is going to be given admission into heaven. But as I've mentioned with all of these verses, there's tons more than I've even included here, that do say that those who don't repent uh, are going to have a hard time. So you want to repent. That's the bottom line. So you say, according to what they had done, they didn't repent. Now, we look at this and we say to ourselves, well, we're not perfect. Of course, Romans tells us for all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin. It's the idea that we sin, but we realize we need we need repentance. We need God's forgiveness. We need to ask for God's forgiveness. We need to tr try to clean up our, our acts. We need to be, become better people, more Christ-like. So here is my major reasoning for disagreeing with universalism. And it's this statement here, the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I realize I didn't take the numbers out. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those of you who do not endorse the Trinity, it says right here, here's a Trinity, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now think about this. Here's my final comment. Jesus knew the fate of his apostles and disciples. He knew that Paul would be beheaded under Nero after years of preaching the good news and being whipped, stoned, and jailed. He knew that Peter and others, such as James the Just, who was his half-brother, Timothy, James the son of Zebedee, and Stephen would also be martyred in really gory ways. In fact, Paul was shipwrecked. He was jailed. He was beaten. He was stoned. The same sorts of things were happening to the other apostles. If you go back to tradition, you can see some really gory ways that these people were killed. If people did not need to hear the good news to repent and accept Jesus' gener generous offer of salvation in this life, their suffering was in vain. Why should you go out to the whole planet and spread the good news and be beaten and jained and <laughs> all this stuff happen if it didn't really matter? At some point, you're going to be reconciled later on. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if God forced its inhabitants to be there. It is a place devoid of darkness, evil, malice, hubris, envy, lust, greed, and hatred. It is a paradise whose inhabitants love God above all else and love their neighbors as themselves. Peace, love, kindness, generosity, patience, virtue, and righteousness reign. The kingdom of heaven is within us as the light of the world who became flesh and dwelt among us. So let's let our light so shine. So thank you guys. Can only drop in. Hi there, Susan. Great to see you too. Great to see Smoky Saint. Uh, all right, so I'm coming back to you guys and I am going to open this up to see if anyone would like to come in for a peaceful conversation. This isn't going to be uh, an un a not peaceful conversation. If you want to come in and share your views, I'm opening it up for you. Okay. So here we go. Let me just get the link to invite people in. La -da -da. Yep. Hello, Susan. All right. And by the way, today at four o'clock, don't uh, be sure to come back because at four o'clock, I'm going to have standing for truth on my channel. So he's going to come in. In fact, last night he hosted a debate between Dr. Kent Hovind and actually, wait, it was, I think it was, was it Smoky Saint? Smoky Saint, I believe you were the, uh, the other debater last night. So good job. I think you did a very good job. I, I'm almost positive I saw you. Well, okay, to, to, wrap, to wrap up my case, basically, I think, I think it's very difficult to translate um, the word ion um, from the Greek. I, th I think it's, it's actually quite ambiguous in a lot of cases what the best way is to um, interpret some of these passages. And um, as I say, there's a, a really strong tradition of believing in apocatastasis. Um, lots of ancient Greek church fathers held, held to this. Um, they also, in a lot of their treatises, talk about how ion should be translated, and not only in the Bible, but also drawing on sources from Aristotle and Plato's works. 
um, wh when they do that. Another another point would be to say that um, apocatastasis has never been reprimanded or, or um, deemed anathema by any of the ecumenical councils who were more than aware of the position's existence. Um, and the reason that it, universalists didn't oppose um, didn't oppose the infernalist position, the position of eternal conscious ta torment, was because they thought it would be useful for some people to believe in that because it might prompt them to commit their lives to Christ actually instead. So um, what, basically to, to round up, I think, I think it's um, a morally better position. I think there's a more consistent story to be told about God being the source of goodness um, on the universalist picture. Um, I think it's completely consistent with scripture. There's even a scriptural case to be made from it for it with all of the um, passages that talk about God's desire for all to be saved, um, God's reconciling the world to himself. Behold, I make all things new. Um, now I, I'm drawing all people up to me. It's over and over again, just as through um, Adam, all men died. So, so through Christ, all, all made alive. Um, lots of scriptural support, support for the universalist position um a, a, a good strong strong history in favor of it and i think i think so so we've got um scripture there we've got tradition there and then i also think reason as well so the philosophical case to be made in terms of um it it being consistent with the conception of a good god or even when, when we ask these questions like um do we share a moral intuition about what would be what it would be better for God to do, right? And um, it seems like most people say, "Yeah, that would be better." Well, isn't God the greatest possible, greatest conceivable being? I I, I think that that's the case. So, um, yeah, that's all. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, I just wanted to say, Era of You is making funny comments about the turkey. The turkey is actually going to be done. So, uh, so I'm not just rotating it. I I got to pull it out of the oven, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna cool it, and and then start cutting it up. <laughs> So sorry, I know that's a well the turkey roasting in the oven, it's only temporary. It'll come out the oven eventually. So, you know. <laughs> uh I will say this. Um first let me start off by saying since I'm um, uh, you know, coming from a Christian standpoint here, um, do I believe that this whole topic, universalism, annihilationism, or eternal conscious torment is actually an essential issue? Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. I don't know if one has to have one or the other position in order to be saved or to pre to preach the gospel. I will say this though, um, regardless of how many early church fathers might have embraced this doctrine, uh, the fact of the matter is that it still uh, has been, and for well over hundreds of years, declared as a heresy by people in the body of Christ. Okay, so we don't, you know, we if people want to bring up this, uh, my church fathers can beat up your church fathers, na 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 boo boo. That doesn't, that means absolutely nothing to me. I go by what the scriptures say. Okay, and and plus some of these early church fathers that have embraced universalism, they already in and of themselves have some other heretical views. So I don't understand why you would resort to the early church fathers who held to your beliefs and say, oh yeah, they're good here, but no, 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 I won't take their views on this issue over here because that's bad. You know, I mean, if that's the way we're gonna try to determine what scripture says, okay, all right, fine. I can't argue with people who wanna take that position. That's just your position that you wanna take. Um, however, I will say this though, and I'll probably end it with this. Uh, I mean, we can further this discussion maybe in a later to chat because I have a lot of questions for the both of you. Um, I was going to say that, in my opinion, this is my opinion, okay, the, the, the issue of universalism and annihilationism, whatever, which one of those two positions you want to take, in my view, I think it actually uh, trivializes, seriously trivializes the finished work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Uh, because with universalism, it asserts that God is going to reconcile all things to himself. It doesn't say, okay, now... Reconciliation and restoration are two different things. And we can talk about that another time. Okay. It doesn't say that God is going to restore every single individual or restore every single thing, but he is going to reconcile all things, which just simply means that he's going to subjugate every aspect of his creation to his feet. That doesn't mean that he's going to redeem the wicked that are in hell right now. Okay. That's a whole other discussion there. But I do believe, uh, and, I, and annihilation, in, in my opinion, just kind of trivializes the finished work of Christ. And people that are going to hell are just going to eventually go poof in the end because, well, you know, the, the God is all loving, right? You know, First John chapter 4, as people like to misinterpret, you know. But if God is, if Jesus, if what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, 
you know, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It seems to me that obviously the believers of Christ at that time were not taking him seriously and saying that, okay, I should pluck my eye out or cut my hand off if I sin. Nobody took that seriously or literally. Okay, but why did Jesus use this type of analogy, use this type of speak? Because he's talking about the utter seriousness of falling into the hands of God's wrath, of God himself under his wrath. Okay, it makes no sense to me. Again, this is my opinion that that Jesus would speak in this fashion if people eventually are just going to go either poof in the end or they're just going to go through a temporary period of reconciliation or refinement, uh, as the Catholic Church teaches, uh, purgatory. So um, now, again, and, 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 and lastly, again, because I hear this claim all the time, oh, the reason why people are teaching the eternal conscious torment is because they want to control people. No. No, that's that's just a, a ridiculous claim. Speaking again from a very subjective standpoint, there might be some individuals in the church who who uh, have this motive, but what about the several other people, the Prince of Preachers, you know, Charles Spurgeon, and, and some of these other people who are going around preaching? They have a, a a a desire in their in their soul to get people's souls saved, okay. And uh, it just makes no sense to me that you can just throw out this accusation that every, you know, if you're going to make that kind of claim that the only people, the only reason why people are teaching this is so that it control people, uh, then I can jump around and say the same thing. Well, the reason why you believe in universalism, because of your emotions, you can't stand the idea of God not sending people to hell in a just fashion. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot more I can say, but I know you got to get going. So, you know, um, okay. Since it's, it's closing for me, you know, SJ and Nathan, and not so, I don't know if you know this fact all about me, but I love to make uh, comparisons with movies. So <laughs> this is going to be uh, this is going to be uh, icing the Matrix. On the cake. Actually, yes, I was going to bring up the Matrix, but before I do that, I just want to show my other point was um, the word that's used. Uh, speaking about you know eternal life that that particular word so not only is it used in titus 1 2 it's also used in second timothy 1 9 and look notice this language he saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our own accomplishments but according to his own purpose and the grace that was given to us in christ jesus before eternity began but hang on before eternity began but eternity well, well, the ISV says before time began. Notice how they translate that word that means eternity to mean time. Other translations will say the world, the universe. Uh, I think the NIV says universe. But literally, it's that same word before eternity began. And then my, probably the most uh, interesting one, the usage of that same word, is in Philemon verse 15, where Paul is talking about you know, that slave master slave relationship. So he's like, uh, in verse 14, yet I did not want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be something forced, but voluntary. And then this is where the word appears. So perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a while so that you could have him back for eternity. But did that master slave relationship last for eternity? No. Obviously, human life, humans only live for so long. And again, it's this language of, okay, perpetual now, like he's a slave for life. Um, and, but, 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 you know, he clarifies in verse 16, no longer as a slave, even though he is in that slave class, but as a, as a brother, uh, as a believer. Now, this is why I think it's very gray. So to use the matrix. Veckel, I... I do appreciate and I do agree with you. And in fact, it is something I brought out in my Matrix series that in Matrix number one, Morpheus, when Morpheus takes Neo down that street with the woman in the red dress, notice this language of like, people are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system. They'll do anything to fight against the truth that you might present to them like you know if, if you're an evangelist to try and save people notice this language you're talking about like trying to save people like Spurgeon was trying to save people like yeah he was basically being amorphous but but as the story continues through very interestingly enough 
Um, so matrix number two, you have this depiction of, okay, now that Neo is now the, the means by which people, more people are being, are able to escape from that matrix system, the prison pods and all that. So they're saving people. By the time you reach number three, it becomes so gray because of the complexities of the, of that other world, which is that matrix world. So now think spiritual dimension versus our physical dimension that when you see the whole thing play out, <laughs> Neo realizes it's not that black and white linear uh, way of, okay, we need to do this to get this result. And it's, and it's just rinse and repeat, repeat, rinse sort of thing. At the end of the movie, in the third movie, he does something that, that does show what Colossians 120 co communicates, that reconciling heaven and earth he reconciles the machine world, the human world, even, even the people in the Matrix prison. Everyone is salvaged. Guess who's not salvaged? Smith. Smith is just like a you know, blinding white light. And in that imagery, I, that's, what I, that's why I think Revelation clearly says, when it says in Revelation 13, you know, the, the, the name that's not written in the book of life, Again, translations will say uh, that the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world with respect to those who are written in the book of life and, and those, and obviously those not written in the book of life is not going to get that salvation. But that's a sloppy translation. That if you follow the Greek wording through, it matches perfectly with that matrix analogy where it's the beast name that was not written in the book of life from eternity past with respect to the lamb who was slain and then slain for what? And the, the, it, it's open-ended slain for the entire realm, whatever that is, that that could include even possible. And, and believe it or not, the early church actually discussed this, a possible other worlds, what's called a principle of plenitude. What if ET could, what if there's some form of other consciousness? that can be part of this one act in Jesus. So just to use that matrix analogy, when, when Neo salvages everything and he has peace for everything, like that's a perfect image of I'm in that middle ground sort of thing where I'm open-minded to the universalist position, but at the same time, there is some form of Aeonios going on moving forward. Um, and yeah. Oh, all good points, each of you. Thank you so much. I want to say hi to Sal, who, who just came in here. Sal's got evidence and reasons as his site, and we're closing, though, so I don't have much to, to say. I don't know if you want to talk on this topic a little bit, Sal, or, or not. Oh, I'm no. not sure what your position is. <clears throat> hey, Sal, I just want no, to say I, I see you all the time in, in other hangouts and stuff, so I just want to say it's nice to meet you. Yeah, actually, um, I just came by to say hi, SJ, and just wanted to express my support and love for the channel. And evidence and reasons actually has kind of uh, gotten a lot of attention that has nothing to do with evidence and reasons. There's a fight in our church and uh, it's, it's in the Washington post. It's all over the, all really? over the place. Yeah. A pastor said he wants to torture all white people in our oh, church. Oh, that's your church. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh my gosh. Of all people. I mean, yeah, I didn't even hear that Stone report. Yeah. And you'll see it. I plan on doing a hangout about that. Actually, I think I find that detestable. So, but so, um, I don't know. I, I just came here to say hi, and that's it. So you can shut your stream. I, I at least wanted to just say <laughs> hi. That's all. Okay, the torching of white people will be temporary, so it's not a big deal. So. <laughs> yes, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that's, like, so that, I didn't position. even know about that. I'm gonna have to look into that. That's terrible. So. I, isn't, um, I agree. I agree that the torturing would be bad, right? But if um, if if the joke, the punchline of the joke is that torturing people for a short time wouldn't be bad because it's only temporary, but it is actually bad. If that's the punchline, right? Doesn't that cut against the idea that universalism isn't really enough because it's not really a punishment? Because the idea is that it is really terrible, but it's not maybe not worth unpacking that. Hey, I have a question. We don't have to answer it right now, but this is a question that often raises up between the annihilationists and e, uh, the EC tiers. Uh, which is works? Which is actually a worst punishment? 
uh, this going poof and never existing, having no conscience for all eternity or suffering in pain for eternity. And oftentimes, you know, I hear people say, oh, the, the, the concept of non-existence is actually far worse than having conscious torment for eternity. I'm like, really? I find that interesting, but. That is interesting. Well, I can say just for my closing, if anyone just got here and you didn't hear my opinion, you can actually just start the video over because I laid out a bunch of slides and put my opinion in there. So it's it's pretty much spelled out. But I, I do believe I can I can acknowledge the point that there is some ambiguity in some of the verses. And so there is there is a need for interpretation to understand exactly what's going on. But my main desire for not promoting universalism is because I, I honestly believe that it's not consistent with what the vast majority is said in the Bible. And so I, I feel like I want to do what the right thing is because I wouldn't want to mislead people and make everybody, everyone think that, oh, it doesn't really matter what I do on this earth because eventually we're all going to be reunited with God anyway. So I can go out and, and sin and do whatever I want to do. That's my big fear. And I know that that sounds like something the early church fathers said, but it's, it's actually a, I think it's a legitimate fear to have that, that if you're, if you don't, if it's not the truth, which is my first premise, and number two, and then if you teach people that it is the truth, and if it really isn't the truth, you're really harming them in a horrible way. Yeah. But I, I hope the C.S. Lewis and Matrix uh, imagery can also add some, not ambiguity into the issue, but but this is this is a, a lot deeper than, than we might think at the surface level. So um, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much. Please, you guys, please like and subscribe and do come again. And I'm on here in 45 minutes. I got to pull that turkey out of the oven. But I'm on here in 45 minutes with Standing for Truth. I think he's a young earth creationist. He just hosted a debate last night. And so he's got a, his channel's starting to boom. But, uh, but anyway, come on back and let me just go get that turkey. So thank you so much, you guys. No worries. Even no. if we disagree sometimes. <laughs>